Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this webinar entitled Management of Cardiovascular Patients in the Context of COVID-19. What have we learnt? This is a webinar sponsored by Servier and hosted by EMG Health. And the goal of today's webinar is to understand the relationship between cardiometabolic disease and COVID-19, and in particular to clarify the role of renin angiotensin system blockers in the context of COVID-19. Those agents, of course, being very widely used in our patients with cardiovascular and metabolic disease. So uh, there are two speakers today. I will talk about the role of the renin angiotensin system, uh, renin angiotensin system inhibitors in COVID-19, but I largely talk about the theoretical concerns and the experimental evidence. I will just touch upon some clinical data, but then uh, Professor Giuseppe Mencia from Milan will talk to you about uh, clinical data, and in particular, clinical data from a very large study from Northern Italy looking at renin angiotensin system blockers and other antihypertensive agents and outcomes in patients who have been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and who have developed COVID-19. Uh, we will be able to have questions and answers, so I'm looking forward to being able to discuss uh, any questions that you might have with myself and Pro Professor Mancio. So, uh, hopefully, I can move my slides forward, but nothing's happening. Let's see. Seems to have stuck. Okay, good. So, as I said, I'm going to start the, our two presentations and I'm going to really address the background to this concern that's been raised about renal angiotensin system blockers in patients with COVID-19 and, as I said, touch upon some experimental and preliminary clinical data. So why is there a concern? Well, actually, maybe the question should be, is there a concern at all? Because this has been largely a concern driven by the lay media. And here are some examples of that from my own country, the United Kingdom. And here you can see three of our very popular newspapers raising concerns about the use of medicines uh, for hypertension that, as you can see here in one of our famous tabloids, might increase the risk of catching coronavirus. Over here, in another very popular paper, in fact, the most widely read newspaper in the UK, you can see a concern raised that ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers might lead to more severe COVID-19 illness. So why has this story arisen? Where has this come from? And to explain it, I need to go back to some basic physiology and perhaps physiology and biochemistry that many of us have forgotten. Because just like the autonomic nervous system, the renin angiotensin system is really two systems, two parallel systems with opposing actions. So we're all familiar with the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system and how they sort of balance each other out. Well, the same is also true for the renin angiotensin system. So most of us, of course, are very familiar with the classic renin angiotensin system, this cascade, whereby angiotensin II acts upon the AT1 receptor, and it's through that receptor that it brings about all these actions that we believe are harmful, detrimental in our patients with cardiovascular and metabolic disease. The uh, activation of the AT1 receptor, as we know, causes vasoconstriction, sodium and water retention, and abnormal tissue growth, for example, hypertrophy and fibrosis. But there is another renin angiotensin system, and indeed, another angiotensin converting enzyme. And although we know about ACE, or maybe more correctly, ACE1, which converts angiotensin 1 
to angiotensin II, there is another angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE2, and ACE2 is a completely different role. So ACE2, among other things, breaks down angiotensin II. So it's one of the ways in which angiotensin II is removed. And in breaking down angiotensin II, ACE2 uh, creates another peptide, angiotensin 1 to 7. And this particular angiotensin peptide actually has many actions, we believe, that are the opposite of angiotensin II. So instead of causing vasoconstriction, we believe that angiotensin 1 to 7 causes vasodilatation. It has uh, growth inhibiting properties. It prevents fibrosis and hypertrophy, we believe. And, and ACE2 also breaks down angiotensin 1, producing angiotensin 1 to 9, which can be converted to this other angiotensin peptide, this what you might call cytoprotective uh, angiotensin. So that is something about ACE2 and the other renin angiotensin system. But again, you might still be thinking, well, what on earth has this got to do with coronaviruses? Well, these coronaviruses, as you know, were first described in the late 1960s. It was somebody from my city, Glasgow, who actually was the first person to name these viruses based on their very characteristic electron microscopic appearance. And as you can see, these viruses were called coronaviruses because of these, what we now call spike proteins that give them this characteristic uh, appearance under the microscope. Now, these spike proteins turn out to be very important because these are what bind to cells. And uh, remarkably, it is ACE2 that is the binding site for the coronavirus spike proteins. In fact, this was discovered for the first serious acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus infection, SARS, I suppose we have to now call it SARS-CoV-1, way back in the early 2000s. In that outbreak of a new coronavirus respiratory disease, it was discovered that ACE2 was the binding site for this virus. And we now know that it is also the binding site for SARS-CoV-2. And interestingly, if you go back to this literature from the early 2000s, looking at the first SARS coronavirus outbreak, it is interesting to look at the distribution of ACE2 in human tissues, uh, and, and in particular, the very high concentration of ACE2 in the lungs, in pneumocytes, in blood vessels, in the endothelium, and also in the gastrointestinal tract and kidney. So this is what we believe happens. So this is a cartoon of the coronavirus. Here are these spike proteins. We believe this is what binds to ACE2 on the cell membrane. But there is another important actor in this, uh, and that is another membrane-bound protease, which is transmembrane protease serine 2, TMPR. Uh, SS2, and that is believed to activate these spike proteins in order to allow them to uh, bind to ACE2 on the cell surface. We'll come back to why this is interesting later. So that is the connection between the SARS coronaviruses and ACE2. Uh, interestingly, there was another SARS coronavirus outbreak uh, more recently, which was the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome uh, coronavirus infection, that does not bind to ACE2. That's probably why it was less effective. Although interesting, its binding site is another enzyme we, we know well, dipeptopeptidase 4 or DPP4. So then what are the theoretical concerns? So we know that SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 bind to ACE2, but why should that be a concern for us and for our patients? 
Well, there has been speculation, and this is really where the whole story started, that ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers might upregulate ACE2, and in that way, perhaps make patients more susceptible to acquiring this SARS-CoV-2 infection and maybe increasing the severity of the resultant COVID-19 illness. Now, is there any evidence for this? Well, I would have to say that there is very little uh, evidence and indeed, as the evidence has been accumulating recently, and I have to say at a very remarkably rapid rate, I think this is becoming less and less likely to be the case. And of course, it matters very much if ACE2 is upregulated by RAS blockers, where that upregulation occurs. If it's in plasma, that might actually not be a bad thing. If it is in tissue, that might be a completely different story. Well, do we have any human evidence? Do we have any robust human evidence? Well, recently, Adrian Boers and colleagues from Groningen in the Netherlands published this paper looking at ACE2 levels in men and women with heart failure treated with ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, and in some cases, neither of these drugs. And rather than go through all the panels in this slide, the very simple message from this very large study is that at least as far as plasma ACE2 levels are concerned, there is no clinically meaningful effect of either an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker on circulating ACE2 plasma concentrations. Now that, of course, doesn't mean it's uh, theoretically possible that these drugs might affect tissue expression of ACE2, but we do not have any evidence for that. And in fact, just in the past few days, there's been um, an experimental study published on one of the online servers suggesting that even if you look at cell membrane ACE2, uh, there is no increased expression with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. Uh, what about whether or not these drugs might increase susceptibility to infection. So maybe if they did increase, for example, the expression of ACE2 on pneumocytes, in, in other words, in the lung, might that make patients more susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection? Well, Professor Mancia will talk about this in more detail shortly, but uh, the, the evidence that we seem to be accumulating is that that simply is not the case. And this is a very large study from Denmark. It's the whole population of Denmark. And in this study, uh, background treatment with ACE inhibitors or ARBs, either individually or either of them, uh, what background treatment with these agents was not associated with a significant risk of becoming infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And uh, you can see here uh, all uh, these drugs and uh, an active comparator and just no evidence of increased susceptibility to infection. But maybe the greatest concern, of course, has been that should patients become infected with SARS-CoV-2, is the severity of COVID-19 illness going to be greater if patients are treated with an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker? And in fact, there are many reasons to think that this, uh, the opposite might be true. Now, I'm going to talk largely about the experimental evidence why we think this is unlikely. In a few minutes, Professor Mancia will tell you about the clinical evidence that we have to date. So why do I say that the experimental evidence uh, suggest that this is unlikely, and maybe even the contrary, the opposite might be true. Well, this is what we believe ha we believe happens when SARS-CoV-2 binds to ACE2. So I I've drawn a cartoon to try and explain what we believe is happening. So here is the spike protein being activated, and of course then the SARS-CoV-2 particle binds and enters the cell. But interestingly, when 
the SARS-CoV-2 virus enters the cell, it actually reduces ACE2 expression. And there is another uh, enzyme involved in that, but ACE2 is reduced. So suddenly in cells infected with SARS-CoV-2, you begin to see an imbalance potentially in angiotensin production and degradation occurring. So ACE, ACE1 is not affected, but ACE2 is downregulated. I told you that ACE2 is responsible for the degradation, the breakdown of angiotensin 2. And in that process, the production of this cytoprotective uh, angiotensin peptide, angiotensin 1 to 7. So in cells infected with the SARS uh, novel coronavirus, you can see that potentially there is increased concentrations of angiotensin 2 and decreased concentrations of this protective angiotensin peptide. And of course, we know that increased concentrations of angiotensin 2 acting through the AT1 receptor might bring about tissue injury, uh, including, for example, inflammation and ultimately perhaps fibrosis. So in fact, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, although it uses ACE2 to enter the cell, actually results in downregulation of ACE2 and potentially upregulation of the classical renin angiotensin system pathway. And there is experimental evidence to support this. In fact, there is even experimental evidence from the original SARS coronavirus outbreak, where in animal experiments using the first SARS coronavirus, it was shown that ACE2 was critical for protecting the lungs against the damage that that particular SARS coronavirus caused. And in fact, there have now been many more experiments showing uh, the importance of ACE2 in protecting the lungs from many different types of injury. So here is an animal experiment looking at the role of ACE2 in protecting against lipopolysaccharide induced lung injury. So this is in rats. So here you see control animal lungs. So nice, healthy looking lungs, large air spaces. And here you see rats that are given lipopolysaccharide. And you can see uh, that the lungs become infiltrated with inflammatory cells, inflammatory infiltrates, edema. You can see the air spaces are lost. And these animals obviously get very sick and in fact, uh, usually die. So here is what happens when you pre-treat these animals with ACE2, and you can see that you protect the lungs against lipopolysaccharide injury. And here is a silencing uh, RNA knocking out the action of ACE2, and you lose that protection uh, against lipopolysaccharide induced lung injury. Here's another animal experiment. I, I'm, I'm, I'm only showing you some of these, but this is uh, an experiment using ACE2 knockout uh, animals. So these mice uh, do not, in the knockout uh, mice do not express ACE2 in tissues, including in the lungs. And these animals have been infected with an influenza strain, so a different way to injure the lungs using a different virus. Here are the wild type mice who do produce ACE2. Here are the ACE2 knockout mice not producing ACE2. This is survival. So all of the animals, of course, are alive, alive when they're initially infected with this influenza virus, but you can see that mortality is much higher in the ACE2 knockout animals. So evidence that ACE2 might be protective. And I mentioned earlier that ACE2 in the plasma might actually be beneficial. And here is a recent experiment using SARS-CoV-2 showing that if you increase the concentration of ACE2 in the supernatant 
fluids uh, bathing these cells, you can reduce cell infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus because the circulating soluble ACE2 binds the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the uh, extracellular fluid and reduces infection of cells. And that may be an interesting approach actually to treating patients with SARS-CoV-2 as we'll come on to in a moment. So what about clinical data? Well, I'm not gonna go through these studies in detail, but you'll hear more about them shortly. But I say the majority of the many studies that are now available uh, do not show any evidence that patients who are treated with RAS blockers are at increased risk of severe COVID-19 infection. And there may even be evidence to the contrary. This is just one study from New York City looking at the likelihood of hypertensive patients developing severe COVID-19 illness. So the definition of severe is shown here at the bottom of the slide. And um, you can see here that patients treated with renal angiotensin system blockers compared to those treated with calcium channel blockers or thiazide diuretics are no more likely to develop severe uh, COVID-19 infection illness than those not treated with these drugs. There is really no difference in the likelihood of severe COVID-19 uh, in patients who were treated with RAS blockers compared to other antihypertensives. And in fact, we've recently done a meta-analysis now looking at when we uh, did this, the 43 studies that had been published at that time. And in fact, we could not find any evidence that uh, pretreatment with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers was associated with increased risk of severe infection. And in fact, if anything, uh, we saw a lower risk of uh, mortality. Now, I have to emphasize that these are all to date non-randomized observational studies. And of course, we need uh, randomized clinical trials. And to finish off with, that's what I'm going to tell you about what's in the pipeline, because we do have several randomized clinical trials getting underway. And it's obvious what these trials might look at, because this is the cartoon that I showed you earlier. And of course, if this hypothesis is correct, if in fact SARS-CoV-2 infection leads to increased concentrations of angiotensin 2 and harm related to that, then perhaps actually using angiotensin receptor blockers might be beneficial in these patients, as of course might be using ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors, by the way, only bind to an inactivate ACE1, they don't affect ACE2. But we might also think about increasing levels of this cytoprotective angiotensin, uh, which is produced by the action of ACE2 because we believe patients infected with SARS-CoV-2 may be deficient in this peptide. I've already mentioned that if we actually put ACE2 into the plasma, then it might bind the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the circulation and stop it binding and entering cells. Uh, believe it or not, there are drugs available that block this protease that, of course, is critical for activating the spike protein that allows the binding to ACE2 in the first place. Now, there are many, many studies underway uh, looking at COVID-19. It's really remarkable how many of these is. This is the list as of earlier today. More, uh, nearly two and a half thousand trials and studies reported in clinicaltrials.gov. And amongst those are a large number of trials looking at renin angiotensin system blockers, mainly, I have to say, angiotensin receptor blockers. Now, I can't show you all of these studies, so I put the larger ones on this slide. There are other smaller ones. I've also not looked at studies uh, discontinuing 
treatment with RAS blockers. I'm, I'm looking here at, at randomized prospective controlled trials that have a placebo group. Many of these, as you can see, have a factorial design. So in other words, they're testing more than one treatment in these patients. But as you can see here, there are a range of different androtensin receptor blockers being studied. And indeed, some of them in very large trials that should give us a clear answer. As I mentioned, there are other approaches. So there are studies using recombinant, recombinant human ACE2. Uh, there are studies using angiotensin 1 to 7. And these studies are the studies that are inhibiting that other uh, membrane protease that activates the spike protein. Believe it or not, these drugs are already available and on the market in Japan. They're used to uh, treat uh, pancreatic disease and they're now being studied. So these are TNPBRS inhibitors. Um, so we will get lots of interesting evidence about approaches based on the hypothesis that I showed you earlier. So what can we conclude from all of this? Well, we do know one thing for sure, and that is that if you stop renal angiotensin system blockers in patients who need them, and here I'm particularly talking about patients with heart failure, because believe it or not, we have two uh, randomized withdrawal studies in patients with heart failure, and there is simply no question, it is statistically proven that if you stop renal angiotensin system blockers in patients with heart failure, they will deteriorate. So we have a theoretical concern about RAS blockers that is not supported by experimental evidence or any clinical observations to date. We have clear evidence that stopping RAS blockers is bad. And I think the very simple message is do not stop treatment. And if you're interested in reading more about this, we, along with many others, have written uh, about this in a lot more detail, and, and you may read this if you wish in, uh, in our review, but there are many other places where you can read this. So at that point, I will stop, and I would like to hand, uh, hand over to uh, my extremely distinguished and much more knowledgeable colleague than me about uh, certainly hypertension and also the renal angiotensin system, Professor Giuseppe Mancia from Italy, from Milano, and uh, he will now talk about some of his own work and some of the clinical evidence that's come out of the experience in Italy and, and the very large data sets that have been uh, available there to try and uh, study this question more in patients as opposed to experimental animals. So I'll hand over to you, Professor Mancia. My name is Giuseppe Mancia. I am Emeritus Professor of Medicine at the University of Milano Bicocca in Milan. And I have been asked to present to you some data and some perspective about uh, the relationship uh, between hypertension and uh, COVID-19. And I will start with uh, the first question, which is, uh, does hypertension increase the susceptibility of, uh, to COVID-19 infection? Now, since uh, several months already, papers have come out showing uh, the frequent association between COVID-19 and hypertension, a relatively high prevalence of hypertension in COVID-19 patients. You see an example here is a, a very large database, about 6,000 COVID-19 patients. And you can see that uh, quite a large number of them had uh, indeed hypertension, more than 43%. And because of uh, this type of data, the perception has been that hypertension may increase the risk of having the COVID-19 infection. But if you look at this slide, 
in which uh, several other studies are reported, uh, you can see that there is uh, a very large uh, difference uh, in the prevalence of hypertension in COVID-19 infected people. We go to almost 40%, like uh, in the previous database, uh, to about 7% in another large database of COVID-19 patients. And this is, of course, uh, a limiting factor in drawing a conclusion about whether hypertension is associated with an increased risk of COVID-19 infection. Large variability in the coexistence rate in different studies, but also the fact that uh, studies reported data on patients uh, with a very wide uh, range of ages. And we know that both hypertension and COVID-19 infection preferentially hits uh, individuals with an advanced age. And also data do not clearly report uh, how many patients were treated and untreated. And since treatment may be involved uh, in this disease and this infection, this is another potentially confounding factors. So it is impossible to conclude at this stage whether hypertension increased susceptibility to the COVID-19 infection. Or we are looking at uh, a chance association between uh, two very common conditions, particularly in the elderly. Some people maintain that an increased risk uh, is possible, relating to the recent evidence uh, that hypertension may derange uh, some aspects uh, of uh, the immune processes. Uh, I do not have time to go into detail. This has been described very clearly in the paper by Kreutz and co-workers recently published in cardiovascular research. So we have to keep in mind that this remains a possibility. That is, that hypertension may be associated with some alterations in the immune system, which weakens uh, antiviral defenses. Then there is a second question on which data are much more clear and conclusions can be sound. That is, that hypertension increases uh, the severity of the COVID-19 infection. You can see here a report from uh, our Institute for Public Health, the National Institute for Public Health, which uh, several weeks ago reported uh, that uh, among people dying for the COVID-19 infection, uh, well, 73% had a history of hypertension. But the age of these people was 81 years. And in people above 70 or 80 years of age, a very large prevalence of hypertension is common. So figures like 60, 70%, even more hypertensive people are not realistic. So the problem whether we are looking at the chance association or there is indeed an increased risk of the COVID infection in people with a high blood pressure remains at present unresolved. Now, the question of uh, the importance of hypertension for the complications of the COVID infection and increased risk of dying as I mentioned before, can be given a positive answer. Here you have a number of studies, eight studies, in which you can see very clearly that people having a more severe infection, mortality or uh, um, hospitalization in intensive care units or a long uh, duration of the disease, well, hypertension was much more common in virtually all these studies compared to people with the less severe forms of infection. So there is a uniform evidence, consistent evidence, that whenever the infection is more severe, hypertension is more common. And here you have once again, an example from the previous very large database I showed, Reynolds and co-workers. You can see that those who died because of COVID-19, well, 63% of them had a history of hypertension. Now, why should hypertension increase the risk of having a more severe infection? Well, I think a reasonable hypothesis is that 
we know that hypertension is associated with uh, a common presence uh, of uh, subclinical or asymptomatic uh, alterations in function and structure of a large number of organs, the brain, the heart, the kidney, the large and small vessels, uh, the lungs also, and the endothelium. And on the other hand, we now know that COVID-19 is not just a pulmonary infection, is a systemic disease, uh, and that uh, the multi-organ involvement uh, of uh, the cardiovascular system is uh, common. And so the two things can work together to make uh, people with hypertension because uh, of uh, a background asymptomatic alteration in structure and function of a number of vital organs uh, and uh, on the vascular system, well, uh, this can be the reason why the infection of uh, COVID-19 virus is more severe. And there is absolutely no question that uh, people having a background uh, alterations in organ structure and function, uh, this is associated with uh, an increased uh, severity of the COVID infection. Here you have an example, organ alteration in the heart in this case uh, was uh, quantified by the elevation of uh, troponin levels. Uh, and you can see that when there was an elevation of troponin levels uh, suggesting the presence of cardiac injury, well, uh, the number of people dying was uh, much greater than when uh, the troponin levels uh, were normal. Now, there is a third aspect uh, of this uh, relationship between hypertension and COVID-19 infection, which has raised uh, a lot of attention. And this is uh, the discovery that uh, the COVID-19 virus enters the cell through an enzyme, ACE2, which is also part uh, of the renin angiotensin system, albeit not a major part, because uh, uh, the renin angiotensin system, the way they influence the cardiovascular system is through the enzyme uh, ACE1 and uh, angiotensin 2. But this was enough to raise the hypothesis uh, that uh, drugs operating through the renin angiotensin system, the RAS blockers, uh, well, they could uh, influence uh, the risk and the severity of the infection. Also because evidence mainly from animals, uh, but also in part from men, uh, suggested that uh, RAS blockers may upregulate uh, the ACE2 enzyme and therefore potentially facilitate the enter of the virus into the cell. Well, this was enough for the press to get into the issue and several newspapers uh, uh, wrote uh, statements uh, you can read here, similar to what you can read here. For example, people with high blood pressure and diabetes could be at higher risk of severe or fatal coronavirus symptoms because of how their medicines work, scientists say. And this raised a lot of concern also between among uh, um, scientific societies uh, because uh, blockers of the renin angiotensin system are life-saving agents. Uh, they are life-saving agents not only in hypertension but also in heart failure, the postmyocardial infarction state and chronic kidney disease. Uh, and we know very well, unfortunately, that uh, when these drugs are stopped uh, in these conditions, there is uh, a rebound of uh, cardiovascular fatal and non-fatal events. There was no information on this issue in uh, humans, however. Uh, uh, both uh, those uh, speculating on the potential harm of blockers of the renal angiotensin system and all denying this, uh, they did not have evidence at their disposal. We thought that some uh, information on this issue could be obtained by looking at the Lombardy database, which is a database uh, involving all 11 million people living in Lombardy, in which uh, very detailed data are available on hospitalizations of the patients, on comorbidities, and uh, on uh, the antihypertensive drugs used, because uh, in Italy, antihypertensive drugs, but many other life-saving drugs, uh, are given free of charge, uh, and because of this, they have uh, recorded, they have to be recorded uh, in a sort of a database. We then looked at what was the treatment taken 
by patients with the COVID-19 infection, more than 6,000 compared to controls with the identical age and gender representation, as far as use of ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor antagonists, but also anti-aldosterone drugs uh, was concerned. And you can see that these drugs were used indeed more frequently in patients uh, with the COVID uh, infection compared to control, 10%, 13% more, but for anti-aldosterone drugs, almost 40% more. But as you can see, this was the case for all other antihypertensive agents. It was also the case for all other agents we included in our analysis, oral antidiabetic drugs, uh, lipid-lowering drugs, anti platelet drugs, anticoagulant drugs, etc., etc. All of them were used uh, more frequently, sometimes much more frequently, in people with the COVID infection as compared to controls. So how can these data be interpreted? We thought that this uh, reflected the fact uh, that these people had uh, a poor background health. And this was the reason for them using uh, a much uh, larger number of uh, life-saving drugs. And indeed, this was confirmed by other data from our database. For example, the fact that uh, COVID-infected people had a much greater rate of previous hospitalization for cardiovascular disease cardiovascular disease, but also respiratory disease, kidney disease, and cancer. And then we had a chronic uh, comorbidity score, which we found a couple of years ago on 2 million people to be a sensitive marker uh, of the risk of people of dying. And you can see that the more compromised score from 2 to 4, the prevalence of cases uh, was uh, much greater than controls. And you can also see that going from the healthiest score to the more co most compromised score, well, the risk of having the infection progressively increased. When all these variables were taken into account and the multivariable adjusted, the uh, uh, risk of having the infection was calculated. You can see that ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor antagonists, anti aldosterone agents, but also all other antihypertensive agents did not show any significant change in risk of the infection. And this was the case also in patients under antihypertensive combination treatment. In Italy, most uh, combination treatments uh, include as a combination component uh, a blocker of the renin angiotensin system. Since the database was very large, we were able to run some uh, sub-analysis and data were replicated in males and females, in older and younger patients, and also in patients uh, who had uh, a critical or fatal form of the COVID-19 infection, those who died. So this removed also, according to our data, the possibility that uh, blockers of the renin angiotensin system could increase the risk of severity of the infection not only the risk of the infection. This was published in the May 1 issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was accompanied by a large database uh, by Reynolds and co-workers, uh, different design. It was a cohort-based study. It compared uh, how frequent was the use of any antipertensive drug class compared to all other classes. And this was done in uh, all patients uh, positive to the COVID virus, uh, and also in uh, hypertensive patients separately. And in no case, uh, the difference in the use of these drugs uh, was uh, uh, significant. So these data went along the same line of the results of our study that uh, neither the severity of the infection, not the risk of the infection seems to be significantly modified by blockers of the renin angiotensin system or in general by antihypertensive agents. Now, how is, uh, as far as uh, this issue is concerned, as far as the relationship between hypertension and the COVID-19 infection, how are things going and what new data are available uh, from May 1st? Well, first of all, most of the following data have confirmed the data published in the New England Journal of Medicine in, uh, on May 1st. And uh, this has been acknowledged by the EMA, the European Medicine Agency, just recently. They reiterate that uh, these drugs do not pose a risk of an increased 
susceptibility or severity of the COVID infection. And at least 20 people supporting this uh, statement. But some other data may be mentioned because they uh, have a potential interest. Uh, for example, in this paper, what was found uh, was uh, what may happen concerning continuation of uh, treatment based on antihypertensive drugs uh, during the infection, which was uh, sometimes not very clear from previous papers. First of all, you can see that uh, mortality was greater in uh, people with a history of hypertension compared to no history of hypertension. This is not new, I've just mentioned this before. But something new is that when uh, treatment was left unchanged and uh, patients under antihypertensive treatment was compared with those with no antihypertensive treatment, as you can see in patients under anti with, uh, with uh, no antihypertensive treatment, mortality during the infection was greater as compared to patients uh, with antihypertensive treatment. According to these authors, uh, there was uh, no difference uh, uh, in relation to the type of antihypertensive treatment, blockers of the renal angiotensin system versus uh, other drugs. So interpretation of these findings might be that uh, uh, it is uh, blood pressure reduction per se, which uh, has a potential of being protected during the infection. But on the other hand, we have now several other data. You can see one example here that uh, lowering blood pressure through blockers of the renal angiotensin system may lead to protection. So that uh, these drugs may indeed, if continued during treatment, exert uh, some kind of protection against the severity of the infection. You can see here a lower mortality when people continue to take uh, blockers of the renal angiotensin system compared to other drugs. And uh, you can also see that this was the case when uh, the two groups were matched by propensity score analysis. And here, is another study, not large, about 400,000 people, again on what happens in people continuing antihypertensive treatment, in this case only RAS blocker based antihypertensive treatment compared to those without antihypertensive treatment. And the data go in the same direction, that is uh, those uh, in which uh, there was uh, no treatment based on the blocker of the renal angiotensin system mortality was greater as compared to those in which treatment continued to be implemented and based on blockers of the renin angiotensin system. So now the emphasis uh, seems to have turned to not the fact that these drugs are not harmful. This seems to be resolved uh, rather clearly. But whether or not blockers of the renal angiotensin system and more in general antihypertensive drugs may exert some kind of protection of these patients if treatment is continued during the infection. And the special aspect of this problem is whether there is a difference between ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor antagonists which have been overlooked before. And in fact if you look at the effects of these drugs uh, on the components of the renal angiotensin system, but also other types of, of uh, results, uh, well, they are not uh, identical, by no means identical. For example, angiotensin receptor antagonists, they're associated with an elevation of angiotensin in two levels in the blood and the tissue, whereas the opposite is the case for ACE inhibitors. And there are data, experimental data mainly, of some negative effect uh, of angiotensin II level on the cardiovascular system, but also on the lungs. Now, protective effect has been uh, advocated uh, in uh, a meta-analysis uh, of four studies in which uh, blockers of the renal angiotensin system appear to have a protective effect uh, compared to control patients. But also some data have been published uh, on the possibility that uh, ACE inhibitors may exert the protection, whereas uh, angiotensin receptor antagonists may be neutral. Now, two data were published in this direction. Uh, both of them, however, have been retracted. You can see that uh, ACE inhibitors showed 
a reduction in the risk of mortality, but this was not the case uh, in uh, angiotensin receptor antagonists. They were retracted because uh, of suspicions on the accuracy of the database from which these results uh, were obtained. But apart from uh, this, uh, the problem of these data, well, some other data seem to go in a similar direction. For example, this very recent paper by Fosbol of Kowerken, a database based, uh, based on the Danish population, there was no significant difference between different antihypertensive drugs as far as the incidence of the COVID-19 infection was concerned. But you can see that even if not significant, there was apparently some difference between use of ACE inhibitors uh, associated with uh, a not significant reduction in the risk of infection which was not seen with the use of angiotensin receptor antagonists. And this goes in this direction, but this time in significance. Uh, hospitalization for outpatient, the risk was lower for ACE inhibitors, but not for angiotensin or angiotensin receptor antagonists. And finally, the last paper I'm going to show you, well, reports uh, similar data. In this case, uh, no difference was found for most severe cases, which is not in the same direction as other studies. But when they look at less severe cases, as you can see, minimal risk was by those uh, not using these drugs. There is uh, no need uh, of these drugs because they were not hypertensive. But once again, ACE inhibitors appear to exert some kind of protection, which was not the case for angiotensin receptor antagonists. So this would be my conclusion. Association between COVID-19 and hypertension is frequent, but the preferential association, it seems to me, to remain unproven. There is, on the other hand, a strong evidence that hypertension is associated with an increased COVID-19 severity. Now, the pre-COVID -co pre use of blockers of the renal angiotensin system uh, does not increase the risk or severity of the virus infection. Some evidence is available that intra-infection antihypertensive treatment, especially when uh, made by RAS blockers, uh, can be protected. Preliminary evidence uh, in need of further studies. And uh, possible differences between uh, protective effects of ACE inhibitors on one side and angiotensin receptor antagonists on the other seems to me to be worthy of further studies. But of course, when we come to the last two points, perhaps observational studies are not enough and we would need to plan for randomized controlled trials. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So now we have a few minutes for questions and we've already got quite a few questions. So uh, I'll have to go through these, Giuseppe. I, I will ask you about some of them because I think some of them are very relevant to what you've just told us. And maybe the first one to start with is, is there any reason to believe that there's any difference between an ACE inhibitor or an, an angiotensin receptor blocker when it comes to either susceptibility to infection or risk of a more severe form of infection? I think you've addressed that, but maybe if we just state that clearly for the listeners and viewers because this has come up in a couple of questions. Oh, uh, I I, I, yeah. John, I missed your first words and the question. Because oh, the me. question is, is there any difference between ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers either in susceptibility to COVID-19 or in terms of severity of COVID-19 infection? Yes, I have shown you the data which are so far available. I wouldn't go further than this. I think they are very preliminary data, but I think that there, there is a rationale for looking uh, more in detail into this uh, possibility because uh, in fact, the two drugs uh, act uh, on the renal angiotensin system differently. Uh, one most obvious uh, difference is the uh, levels of angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is involved in uh, regulation of ACE2, is involved in some direct effects on the organs. Uh, and this is enough, it seems to be enough uh, to me to continue along this line. Okay, so there's a question here about 
at what point would we stop um, an ASNIPT or, or ARV? So a patient uh, with, with hypertension or heart failure on a renin angiotensin system blocker develops COVID-19 infection uh, and they become hypotensive. So for example, their blood pressure dropped to say 95 millimeters of mercury systolic. Is, is that the time when you would say, well, I better stop treatment at least temporarily or, or what, what should our approach be? Well, this is a clinical consideration, which of course uh, is always valid. I think if there is a excessive reduction in blood pressure, especially a symptomatic reduction in blood pressure, then of course uh, treatment should be uh, down titrated, uh, no question about that. Yeah. In this regard, it is interesting that one of the available papers, which, in, which was the paper on uh, uh, intra-infection use of uh, uh, blockers of the renin system, showed that compared to controls, uh, the level of blood pressure was, uh, I mean, there was no evidence uh, of uh, excessive blood pressure reduction by these drugs. But uh, things are complicated and the you know, hypotheses are uh, coming in uh, one after another at al almost every day. And I've come across, <laughs> for example, a hypothesis that uh, COVID-19 virus may use uh, ACE2 receptors uh, and therefore somehow reduce uh, the availability of the steps uh, in the renin angiotensin system which lower blood pressure when blockers of the renin angiotensin system are used. According to this hypothesis, the possibility exists that the blockers of the renin angiotensin system are less effective during the COVID-19 infection. So we have another hypothesis to look at. <laughs> okay, so um, maybe a couple of other quick questions. So one I don't know the answer to, I've tried to look it up but I can't find it, but maybe you do, Giuseppe. Is atrial fibrillation or is atrial fibrillation seen or worse COVID-19 outcomes? I actually don't remember specifically seeing that. Did you see that in, in your very large data set? So atrial fibrillation. No, I, I don't know anything about atrial fibrillation, but uh, I think one interesting aspect, John, uh, and uh, I think you can clarify this. Uh, uh, people having advanced heart disease and heart failure in particular, are they more sensitive to any change in the renin angiotensin system treatment during infection? Again, we are talking about what happens during the infection. Yeah, I mean, uh, any, any condition that stops you drinking, any condition where you're losing salt and water for example, because you're pyrexial or you're hyperventilating, uh, you can get into trouble. You can get, you can become more hypertensive. You can develop renal dysfunction. So, realistically, anybody with any severe infection may well need to have the renal angiotensin system blockers temporarily withdrawn. We see that with ordinary bacterial pneumonia, uh, influenza virus, and so on. But here's a very important and a very interesting question. Uh, I'll, I'll let you ha ha answer it first and then I'll say something. So what about racial susceptibility if you're Asian, if you're of African descent, uh, does that mean that you'll have a different outcome than if you are Caucasian or European? Well, some papers, uh, um have uh, looked at this uh, and although on a small number of patients uh, they seem to uh, come to this conclusion that can be racial differences. In our database of course uh, we most of the people were Caucasian so we couldn't address this issue but it is of course a very important issue. So we have a, a probably more multi-racial population in the UK than in northern Italy and it's very clear that um, actually Asians living in the UK are the most susceptible group, it seems, to COVID-19 infection, or certainly the group most likely to have an adverse outcome. So 
Initially, there was a lot of concern about people of African descent, and I think there is definitely an increased risk in, in those individuals, but it seems to be even greater in, in patients of Asian, particularly South Asian, so Indian, uh, Pakistani, Bangladeshi origin, and there are lots and lots of interesting discussions about that. Some of it's probably socioeconomic, as size of households, uh, likelihood of transmission within family units, but there's also, uh, and it goes back to the very title of our uh, symposium, Giuseppe, uh, there's far more cardiometabolic, particularly metabolic disease amongst the Asian population, at least in the UK, so they're much more likely to have obesity, which seems to be playing a very important role, diabetes and so on. So this is, I think, a really, really interesting area. And obviously in the US, there's been a, a lot written about the racial disparities there. Although to my mind, those are very hard to disentangle from socioeconomic issues as, as well. So um, I'm just see, look to see if there are any more questions here that we might want to look at. So there was one about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, and whether or not ACE inhibitors or an angiotensin receptor blockers can be used to treat hypertension in people with COPD. What's your thoughts about that? Yes, of course, uh, they can be used. Uh, I think uh, the choice is quite large because even beta blockers, which uh, uh, years ago were thought uh, not to be the best drugs uh, to treat hypertension in these people. Now we do have data that uh, uh, you can give them uh, relatively in a relatively safe uh, fashion. Of course, this doesn't apply to asthma or other uh, acute conditions, but for uh, COPD, I think uh, we can use uh, more or less uh, the same drugs uh, we use uh, to treat hypertension in people without COPD. Okay, well, with that, I'm sorry to say it's uh, time's up. We've come to the end of this. We could probably talk a lot longer because it's such an interesting area. So I would obviously like to thank uh, Professor Mancia very much indeed for bringing his huge knowledge and expertise, and indeed his very large data set and impressive New England Journal paper to this discussion today. Thank you for, to EMG for hosting the meeting, and thank you very much to Servier for sponsoring, sponsoring the meeting. And of course, the most thanks goes to all of you who uh, spent some time today attending this. I hope you enjoyed it. We certainly did. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt.